first thing Monday morning, NASCAR should announce Homestead Miami Speedway, site of the 2026 NASCAR Championship, if they know what's good for them, at least. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove. In a year full of fantastic photo finishes, the final two laps of today's race may take the cake. We'll recap all things Homestead in just a moment, but first, Carrera sent me their new Hendrick Motorsports Carrera Go slot car sets. I grew up playing with slot cars as a kid. These would make an awesome gift for any Hendrick Motorsports fan this holiday season. Look at the details on the car decals. Click the link down below to check out the Carrera Go slot car sets. And if you're feeling something a little more robust, check out the Carrera Digital 132 Daytona Challenge. Look at the slot cars for this bad boy. Holy moly, I could put this on my shelf. The size, the scale, the spectacle is through the roof. So no matter what kind of slot car enthusiast you are, if you're a Hendrick fan or just a NASCAR fan, be sure to check out the Hendrick Motorsports Carrera slot car sets. I'll put the links to everything down in the description below. We witnessed a round of eight thriller out at Homestead Miami Speedway today. So many headlines, chief among them. Top story has to be the seven car. Is it cursed? Seriously, we used to joke about the Roush 60 car being cursed no matter who seemed to drive it. Between Corey LaJoy and Justin Haley, there is something evil in that number seven car. I'm convinced, can't catch a break. Okay, no, in all seriousness, that is not the top story. Let's start with the finish. Let me set the stage. Coming into this race, there were four drivers well below the playoff cut line, desperate for a win to try and qualify for the championship four. Denny Hamlin has won almost everything in this sport except a Cup Series title, trying to make his first championship four in three years. Then there's Tyler Reddick, trying to get Michael Jordan's 23-11 racing into the championship four for the first time in their young history. Then there's Ryan Blaney, the defending series champion. His teammate locked in last week, could Blaney go back to back for Team Penske? Then of course, Chase Elliott, the sport's most popular driver, the 2020 series champion looking to get back to glory four drivers all desperate for a win restarting first second third and fourth with seven laps to go unfreaking believable tyler reddick out front with two laps on his tires those two laps made a huge difference on the restart when denny hamlin on fresh tires rocketed around the outside to take the lead Ryan Blaney settled into second. Reddick fell to third. So many potential storylines were going through my head in those final seven laps. Denny Hamlin with the huge move to take the lead, and people call him a choke artist? That was incredible. Denny Hamlin, at the same time he's suing the sanctioning body, is about to go back to the championship for getting it done in the clutch. I had built that whole narrative out in my head until two laps to go. When suddenly, Ryan Blaney surges out in front. Then I'm thinking... Team Penske, two for two, who can stop them? Every year, they are so damn good in the clutch late in the season, they've got these playoffs figured out. Good for Ryan Blaney, what a move. Then, on the final lap, Tyler Reddick goes from third to first. First dispatching of Denny Hamlin, kept his momentum, then sails it in on the outside in turn three, somehow gets that 45 to stick. Tyler Reddick, twice won the Xfinity Series championship at this very racetrack, is into the championship four for the first time in his cup career. Michael Jordan, maybe the greatest American athlete of all time, is there to give him a bear hug on the front straightaway. What is going on? How did this how did this suddenly happen? Third to first in one lap. That's hard to do at Daytona these days. At Homestead, well after a restart, on two laps older tires, that should be impossible. Tyler Reddick did the impossible in turns three and four. I'm still speechless. One of the greatest pure finishes in NASCAR history. Look, I love a photo finish. 0.001 second. The scoreboard can't even get it right. That's dramatic. That's thrilling. When Larson sent it on the outside of Chris Buescher at Kansas, Ryan Sieg versus Sam Mayer at Texas. I could go on and on. This season has been full of phenomenal photo finishes. But in my opinion, this race, this finish, collectively, the final seven laps, even just the final two laps, were the best finish of the NASCAR season. This was maybe the best finish 
I don't want to say that I've ever seen. I don't want to be a prisoner of the moment, but this is up there. I I safely can say this is top 10 best finishes I've ever seen, maybe even top five. I'm not going to go number one. Don't want to be prisoner of the moment, but that's how beautiful this was because I don't think Denny Hamlin gave this race away. Credit to his pit crew for finally stepping up in a big moment. They held serve on that final cycle, gave him a shot. He got a great restart, had clean air, but Hamlin was never great on the short run today. He was getting beat on fresh tires consistently, so I'm not surprised Ryan Blaney got past him. And even Ryan Blaney, immediately, the comments are saying, I can't believe he gave Tyler Reddick the top, the preferred homestead line. I believe it especially after Tyler Reddick rolled the bottom so well in turns one and two to get second, he rolled the bottom and still had momentum on Blaney going down the back straightaway. And Blaney, a lap before, used the bottom to clear Denny Hamlin for the lead. The bottom lane looked fast. If Ryan Blaney goes top there, who's to say Reddick doesn't just roll the bottom and slide job him? Or, you know, if you roll the top, you give Reddick then the opportunity to just stuff you in the fence. So I don't think Ryan Blaney necessarily made a mistake by letting Tyler Reddick run the outside lane. The only mistake maybe Ryan Blaney made, and I know I'm armchair quarterbacking over here, if you're not going to run the top, Maybe Blaney should have just full committed to the bottom. Again, he used the bottom to take the lead just a lap before, and then you have the opportunity to drive it in really deep, maybe slide up in front of Reddick, no matter how much speed Reddick carries. Now you're the aggressor, you have the option to run Reddick out of room should you choose. If anything, maybe Blaney should have run the very bottom. That's just me sitting here. I'm not a race car driver. I was just watching what happened the two or three laps leading up to the finish. But point is, I don't think the finish was about Denny Hamlin not getting the job done or Ryan Blaney making a mistake. This finish was about Tyler Reddick going superhuman. Drove it in hard and somehow, someway got that car to stick. Again, on two laps older tires unbelievable. That's why this was such a great finish. Nobody blew it or lost it or made a big mistake. We just witnessed a super talented young race car driver do something that none of us are capable of doing. That's sports. That's what makes professional sports awesome. And that's what made this finish, in my opinion, one of the best NASCAR has ever seen. Big picture. What does this mean? Tyler Reddick is through to the championship four for the first time in his cup career, first time for 2311, and that's a huge deal. I said this a couple of weeks ago, but since 2019, so over the last five, six years, it's always Team Penske, Team Hendrick, and Joe Gibbs racing in the championship four. The only exception was Ross Chastain track house in 2022. Other than that, it's always Penske, Hendrick, and Gibbs who sweep the championship four. So for Reddick, to get 2311 into the championship race, that's rare. Very impressive, worthy of praise. A huge step for this team, especially with so much uncertainty on the horizon. 2311 is part of that lawsuit against NASCAR. Depending on how a judge rules in a couple of weeks, they may not get to keep their charters for next season, which will affect their business immensely. To get this win in the clutch, to lock into the championship four is a huge, huge accomplishment. And it was awesome that Michael Jordan was there. Bubba Wallace was quick to come congratulate his teammate. Reddick celebrating with his kids, his family. Beautiful scenes on the front straightaway at Homestead Miami Speedway. Congratulations to Tyler Reddick. Again, I don't think this finish was about other drivers losing. This was about Tyler Reddick putting together a superhuman final lap. Congrats to Reddick. I don't even know where to go from here. Let's just look at the top finishers real quick. Maybe that'll jog some ideas. Top six are all playoff drivers. Reddick, then Blaney, I think, finished his second at Homestead for the second consecutive year. Then the Gibbs guys, Denny Hamlin, third. Christopher Bell, who had a 5.7 average finish in these playoffs, finishes fourth, so improves on that number. And Chase Elliott, a strong top five. Second week in a row, I think he had top five speed. I'm glad he got a better result this time around. William Byron, another Hendrick car, finishes sixth. Kind of a a quiet day for Byron, but he was in the top 10 all along. Just didn't earn a ton of points compared to these other guys. But then you got to keep going. Hey, shout out AJ Allmendinger. He's so dang good here for no reason at all. Another top 10. Keep going, keep going. Ooh, Kyle Larson, 
back-to-back -back weeks just outside of the top 10. I mentioned the roller coaster. It's been a roller coaster season for Larson. Six wins. Most of anyone in the field was the top seed coming into the playoffs. Top seed this round, but just the last two weeks at Las Vegas, got some nose damage, then had a terrible pit stop, went two laps down, overcame a lot to still finish 11th, but left a lot of points on the table. Still, because he's the number one seed, he earned that all year long. He was in a good points position today. But once again, issues early on, a flat tire, got into the outside wall, drugged that rear diffuser, grinded it down, didn't lose a lap or anything, but certainly scrubbed some speed out of the number five car. These diffusers are extremely aero sensitive. It took the five team most of stage one and the rest of stage two to get that car drivable, top 10 worthy once again. And then in stage three, Kyle Larson went to work. I mention all the time how resilient this team is. Today is a perfect example. He hit the wall, was 30th place with damage to a very sensitive aero part of the car. Yet by the end of this race, he was running second, chasing down the leader, and even had a shot at the lead. The reason we had a restart with seven to go is because Kyle Larson shipped it on Ryan Blaney, tried to squeeze three wide middle to take the lead, and just... Oh, lost it. <sighs> That's Kyle Larson for you. Extremely impressive until he oversteps and makes a mistake. I don't blame him for going for it there. It was going to be tough to pass Ryan Blaney. The laps were winding down. Blaney was trying to use Austin Dillon as a pick, but if you could get to Blaney's right rear, you had him. There just wasn't quite enough room. It was a little too sketchy, a little too dicey and Larson overstepped. An aggressive mistake, that's Kyle Larson. He only lost one position though. <laughs> Worth mentioning, he was second at the time, but they were so far ahead of third that despite spinning, he was like third by the time the pace car picked him up. So we only lost one position by going for it. He lost a few more on pit road because they had to you know, reattach or reset the rear diffuser flap. So I guess ultimately that mistake cost him like six or seven spots. But at the same time, Larson was one of those playoff drivers not in must-win territory. He had a 30-plus point cushion coming into this race, so I'm sure he felt he could be a little more aggressive. Good luck trying to get Kyle Larson to rein it in, to back it down. That's not... That's not him. You live with the success, you also live with the shortcomings. And unfortunately today, finishing 13th, another disappointing result for the number one seed. If we look at the points now, Kyle Larson is seven points out. I said it before the round began, because he's the number one seed, he can afford one bad race. Two bad races, and you're playing with fire. That's what Kyle Larson is finding out. Seven points out going to one of his best tracks, or at least one of Hendrick's best tracks. He could be in a much worse spot. Like I still feel decent if I'm a Kyle Larson fan, but certainly that aggressive mistake today could come back to cost you. You can see how the rest of the points shake up here. Tyler Reddick winning from below the cut line tightens up that bubble quite a bit. Even William Byron, who's been so solid, so steady recently, still finished top 10 today. He's only seven points to the good. Logano and Reddick winning and all the other guys earning so many stage points today puts William Byron in a precarious position. Christopher Bell, even as good as he's been, he has an issue at Martinsville. He's out. He doesn't have to run top five next week, but he can't run 25th or wreck or have a mechanical failure. So there's pressure even on Christopher Bell, as consistent as he's been. Denny Hamlin, minus 18, he's great at Martinsville, at least historically speaking, he's been great at Martinsville. I wouldn't say he's in must-win territory. He's still, as he's put it, in must-perform territory. He earned a lot of stage points today, obviously a good top five finish. Stings to not get the win, but I won't say he's in as desperate of a situation as these other two, unfortunately, are. Ryan Blaney and Chase Elliott both led a ton of laps today. We're both in the mix late in this race, but didn't get the job done. They've got one more chance to pull off the upset. Pull off the upset. That's probably not the right choice of words. They are both former champions who drive for two of the best organizations in the series. It would be an upset in this case, considering the points deficit, but both drivers are more than capable of winning any given week. Let's put Homestead Miami Speedway on the groovy gauge. How's that sound? The groovy gauge is powered by electric e-bikes. Head to electric e-bikes to find a ride that suits you. 
This race had it all. I'm pretty sure I've been smiling this whole video for good reason. All the important playoff guys came to play today. Carson Hosevar meant to give him a shout out earlier, leading the rookie of the year points, had a fantastic top 10 run. Martin Truex Jr. running that beautiful throwback paint scheme to his championship season, also looked like a top 10 threat most of the day. Alex Bowman continued his steady playoff success. The good drivers bubbled to the front and put on a show for us fans. Raw Speed decided stage one with Tyler Reddick pulling away. Fuel and Tire Strategy decided stage two with Denny Hamlin getting the best of everyone. And stage three came down to short run speed. So it had something for everyone. The best drivers and teams raced it out amongst themselves. And of course, an all time classic thrilling finish. You're not wiping this smile off my face 100%. 100% on the groovy gauge. I have no gripes, no concerns whatsoever. This car was built for intermediate racing, or it, actually it wasn't. It was built for the exact opposite. It was built for road courses, but that's the thing about NASCAR. NASCAR racing is at its best when the cars are uncomfortable. This road course car looks uncomfortable at intermediates. That's what leads to great racing. Fantastic race today, 100% on the groovy gauge. I can't pick this one apart. Especially with the championship battle looming in the background, this race had everything. This race felt like a championship race should. I joked about it at the beginning of the show, but I wasn't joking. I'm dead serious. This track needs to host championship weekend once again. This car track combo is just too good to pass up on. It was reported months ago, and I saw it reported again this weekend, that the city of Homestead, Florida is planning to bid on the 2026 championship weekend. I hope NASCAR grants it. This is a NASCAR-owned facility. I know it's not in Miami, but it's close enough to a major glitzy media market. I know they've torn some grandstands down and it's not always packed, but if you build this up as championship weekend returns, I think it would be a phenomenal weekend. I do hope the championship returns to Homestead by 2026. Do I think it'll happen? I don't know because NASCAR also owns Phoenix Raceway and they've invested a lot of money into that facility and that's another major media market. So we'll see, but I hope I hope it happens. Today's race felt like a championship race. I'm afraid that Phoenix in a couple of weeks will not <laughs> come close to living up to this hype, unfortunately. But we'll wait and see. This was a great race. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Thanks for tuning in to my post-race recap. Leave a like if you enjoyed this video. Helps me out a ton. Also, subscribe if you're new to the channel. Love all things NASCAR. We talk NASCAR every day, all year long. Big thank you to my very generous Patreon supporters as well. Busy week ahead. Tune in Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time. I'll be streaming live Groovy Hollow, my annual charity Halloween-themed iRacing event. This year, the twist is I'm driving in it so come cheer me on hopefully i don't embarrass myself i've been practicing i promise hopefully we put together a good run i can't promise a, a finish quite like we saw at homestead here but i'll do my darndest you know i'll send it on the final lap i've got nothing to lose thanks for watching y'all i will see you again soon have a great rest of your weekend